Celiac disease is an autoimmune gastrointestinal condition that causes a variety of health issues, including issues with bones, teeth, and skin. In this lesson, we're gonna talk about what this condition is. We're gonna talk about risk factors, signs and symptoms, how we can diagnose it, and how we can treat it. So celiac disease is also known as gluten-sensitive enteropathy and celiac sprue. These are both terms for the same condition. As I mentioned before, it's an autoimmune gastrointestinal disease that leads to malabsorption and changes in bowel habits. We're going to talk way more about this in later slides. And this condition is more common in females as are many autoimmune conditions. An onset of this condition can occur at any time in life, but it generally occurs earlier in life, even as early as infancy. And celiac disease is associated with other conditions, including depression, paranoia, epilepsy, myopathy, osteoporosis, and infertility. Many of these are probably due to the malabsorptive effects of celiac disease and also due to the decreased quality of life that patients with celiac disease have. So what is the pathogenesis or what is the etiology of celiac disease? It all has to do with a triggered mucosal inflammatory response within the small intestine due to gliadin or gliadin, which is a breakdown product of gluten. So you probably have heard that gluten causes celiac disease or there is gluten sensitivity. Well, it's actually sensitivity or an inflammatory response to gliadin or gliadin, which is actually a breakdown product of gluten. So gluten is responsible, but it's actually the breakdown product of gluten. And what happens is this triggered mucosal inflammatory response causes autoimmune destruction of small bowel mucosa. So this usually occurs in the proximal bowel most often. It can occur many different areas in the bowels. So what happens is that it leads to deficiencies in certain elements. So the proximal bowel, the duodenum, is responsible for absorption of folic acid, iron, and calcium. So FIC, that's how you can remember that. So F-I-C, FIC, folic acid, iron, and calcium, are elements that are absorbed in the proximal bowel, and these are what often become deficient in celiac disease due to the autoimmune destruction and an inflammatory response in the small intestines. So there are key components of the pathophysiology of celiac disease I wanna delve into a bit more. So the first one is T cell infiltration. This is where it all begins actually. The T cells infiltrate the mucosa. So the intestinal mucosa here, there are intestinal epithelial cells and what happens is there are T cells that essentially infiltrate in and these T cells are sensitive to gliadin or gliadin and this is what really triggers a lot of the autoimmune inflammatory response to gliadin and what happens over time and what happens after exposure to gluten proteins or gliadin is that the crypts within the intestinal mucosa enlarge it, we get crypt hyperplasia so in this image here you can see here are some of the villi and here are some of the crypts and you can see these crypts are enlarged. And what happens over time with continual inflammatory responses and autoimmune destruction, we get villus atrophy. So in this image here, you can see the villi are actually all short. They're all truncated. So that's basically the main mechanism of what happens in celiac disease. So we get this villus atrophy. These villi are in the intestinal lumen for a reason. They increase the surface area for absorption of nutrients in our diet. So if we continually have autoimmune destruction of these villi and microvilli, they essentially get flattened out and we lose that surface area. We lose our ability to absorb nutrients. And that is one of the major issues in celiac disease. Our decreased ability to absorb nutrients and things from our diet. So I've talked about the pathogenesis of celiac disease, but what are some of the risk factors for getting celiac disease? Why do those T cells go haywire and enter and infiltrate the intestinal mucosa in the first place? Well, a lot of it has to do with family history and genetics. So it's been found that about 10 to 15 percent of first degree relatives, so brothers and sisters and children and their parents, that first degree of relation, you have a 10 to 15% chance if one of those first degree relatives has celiac disease themselves. So there are genetics involved. The genetics that have been found are that HLA DQ2 or DQ8 are the alleles responsible or implicated in celiac disease. 
There are other non-HLA locus genes that appear to be responsible as well. There's a lot of genetic component behind this, so I won't get into all the details here, but there are a lot of genes that are behind the pathogenesis of celiac disease. Having other autoimmune conditions can increase your risk for celiac disease as well. A lot of times it's connected to these genes we just talked about. So if you have other autoimmune conditions like type 1 diabetes, Sjogren's syndrome, juvenile chronic arthritis, you're at risk for having celiac disease as well. And other genetic conditions. So having a inherited genetic condition is actually an increased risk of having celiac disease. So individuals with Down syndrome have an increased risk for celiac disease, Turner syndrome individuals, and Williams syndrome. These three syndromes are at an increased risk for having celiac disease as well. So what are some of the features of celiac disease? So it all makes sense that gastrointestinal symptoms are the mainstay of celiac disease due to that T-cell infiltration and all that inflammatory response in the intestines. So we get abdominal pain. We get inflammation in the small intestines and we get abdominal pain. And this also leads to diarrhea. And the diarrhea is chronic or recurrent. So these two usually occur after ingesting something with gluten or gliadin in it. And because of chronic and recurrent diarrhea, we get weight loss as well. And the malabsorption doesn't help either. So after chronic inflammatory responses and destruction of those villi and microvilli we talked about, we lose that absorptive area. We lose our ability to absorb nutrients. We actually have malabsorption. So this also plays a role in weight loss too. So particular deficiencies we get are vitamin D deficiency. So some of those fat soluble vitamins are not able to be absorbed as well as they could. Vitamin K is another example. We can get iron deficiency as well. And we can also get folate deficiency and calcium deficiency too, just like we talked about earlier. We can also get distension and bloating due to the diarrhea and we can get steatorrhea. So that all plays into the malabsorption. We are not able to absorb fats well, we're not able to digest fats well, we get steatorrhea. We lose some of those fat-soluble vitamins as well in the process. And interestingly, there is also dermatological features with celiac disease as well. This is not talked about as frequently. We can get dermatitis herpetiformis. So dermatitis herpetiformis is a particular skin condition that celiac disease patients can get. It is due to an autoimmune cutaneous eruption. And these eruptions are intensely puritic and they are inflammatory papules and vesicles. And they're most often found on the forearms, the buttocks, the knees, and the scalp. And like I mentioned before, certain celiac disease patients can get this. So a subset of celiac disease patients can get dermatitis herpetiformis. So all individuals with dermatitis herpetiformis have celiac disease, but not all celiac disease patients have dermatitis herpetiformis. Some other features of celiac disease include the following, failure to thrive. So that's essentially like weight loss and malabsorption, but we can think about it in children. So if children have celiac disease, they might not be growing the way they should. They might be having failure to thrive. So this is a particular condition that can cause failure to thrive. We can also see osteoporosis and metabolic bone disease. So you can see this in even younger patients where they get osteoporosis, thinning of the bone. So you can see the trabecula, you can see inside of a bone here. And then in osteoporosis, it becomes more parotic, more pores, and it becomes thinner. And that is all because of the decreased absorption of calcium and vitamin D. We can also see anemia. So we can get anemia through a variety of factors. Iron deficiency, we talked about iron being one of those three elements that are absorbed in the duodenum. So Having iron deficiency can cause iron deficiency anemia, but we can also have vitamin B12 and folate deficiency anemia. So you might see microcytic anemia, you might see macrocytic anemia, or you might see normocytic anemia, a combination of both. And you might also see idiopathic peripheral neuropathy and non-hereditary cerebellar ataxia. And fatigue is also common with these patients as well. You can also see recurrent headaches, reduced fertility, dental enamel hypoplasia. Again, all of these are due to decreased absorption. They are malnourished essentially. And the dental enamel hypoplasia can be due to decreased calcium and vitamin D as well. 
And it can also get aphthous stomatitis. Aphthous stomatitis are canker sores. So how do we make the diagnosis of celiac disease? The diagnosis involves testing for serum autoantibodies while the patient is on a gluten-containing diet. If they are not on a gluten-containing diet, then there's no point in actually testing for the serum autoantibodies. They will not be there. So we need to have the patient on a gluten-containing diet because we need to stimulate their autoimmune response in order to see these autoantibodies. And what you're looking for is serum IgA anti-endomyceum, which is pathognomonic for this condition. And this actually contains an autoantigen to tissue transglutaminase. So you're going to see TTG as the test you're going to use. You can also see serum IgA antiglycan as well. And because IgA is associated with the TTG, IgA deficient individuals have a false negative anti-TTG. So the test you want to do in order to assess whether a patient has celiac disease are to do a TTG and an IgA because if they are deficient in IgA, you can't actually tell if they have any TTG. So you need to re you need to actually measure IgA at the same time as the other tests while the patient is on a gluten-containing diet. And that's not everything. So once you do those tests, you actually have to confirm it through small bowel biopsies, usually in four locations to confirm. And these are often in the duodenum where the duodenum is mostly affected. And what you'll see with those biopsies, if the patient does have celiac disease, is they have increased intraepithelial lymphocytes, villus atrophy, crypt hyperplasia, the things we talked about earlier. And again, this is required to distinguish from non-celiac gluten sensitivity. So you might have gluten sensitivity and have a positive TTG with normal IgA, but then you might not have those other findings with the small bowel biopsy. So you need both. So times when you want to suspect a diagnosis of celiac disease, if there's weight loss with recurrent chronic diarrhea, if there's any signs of malabsorption like we talked about earlier, or if there's iron deficiency anemia, especially in young male patients, that is abnormal. So you want to think about celiac disease as a possible diagnosis for those patients. So once we make the diagnosis, how do we treat it? So the treatment for celiac disease is, again, a strict gluten-free diet. That's what you need. That is the mainstay treatment for celiac disease. You want to avoid gluten entirely. So you want to avoid what I call the brow foods, B-R-O-W, B for barley, R for rye, O for oats, and W for wheat. And rice and corn flour are safe for these patients. So if you maintain a very, very strict gluten-free diet, no gluten at all, you should see improvement of symptoms within three months. We might also use vitamin supplementation as well because these patients are often deficient in a lot of vitamins and nutrients. But if a patient has a poor response to a very strict gluten-free diet, you may want to reconsider the diagnosis. So you might want to consider another diagnosis. And just as a side note, for dermatitis herpetiformis, that skin condition that can occur in celiac disease patients, Gluten-free diet is the treatment for that condition. It will help that condition, but you can also use Dapsone as well. Dapsone is actually something that can help resolve the skin lesions even before that three month period of strict gluten-free diet. So could use Dapsone, but again, the mainstay for treatment for dermatitis herpetiformis is a gluten-free diet as well. So if you want to learn more about other gastrointestinal conditions, please check out my gastrointestinal playlist. And if you haven't already, please consider liking, subscribing, and clicking the notification bell to help support the channel. And as always, thanks so much for watching and I hope to see you next time.